Uh, we're going to be talking about DevOps transformation today, and uh, which is, yeah, the process of becoming a DevOps organization. And uh, first of all, I want to say that don't mind my sweat stains. I sweat professionally, like on an Olympic level. I like something that I like to do in my free time and also all of the other time, like 24 hours a day. So, yeah. So, uh, who am I? My name is Todor Todorov, and I'm a cloud principal engineer at Dell Technologies. Uh, I've been a software developer throughout my whole professional IT career. I am a .NET developer, mainly. But I really embraced DevOps in the past year since it, it, it is a thing. And I believe that this is the way things should be done. Currently, I'm doing DevOps things. Uh, but yeah, as I said, I'm a developer by heart. I uh, am an infrequent blogger. Infrequent means lazy because, yeah, I very seldomly post anything on my website, but it happens from time to time. And I am a clean fanatic. I will fight you to the death for that tab right there. And also, I have three boys. Please send your love and support. Thank you for that. I am, like to yell at karaoke, hence my profile picture, and I enjoy beating bosses in dungeons in World of Warcraft. So, well, that's about me, generally, but before we go on, before I start explaining what I think DevOps transformation is, I would like to do a little disclaimer here. I'm not here to teach you anything. I'm not here to tell you how it's done, most likely I am wrong. But I like being on places like that because people can tell me that I'm wrong and can give me good arguments about it. And this makes me progress myself. And for that, thank you. But yeah. Bef now let's talk about the elephant in the room. Very scary DevOps. And you should scream now. And uh, yeah, it's the, the buzzword that I almost hate already uh, to a point that it became really uh, mystified and everybody really consider it and take it in their own perception what DevOps is. And that's why I would like to first tell you that in order to, to know what DevOps is, you have to dare to dream. You have to dream that things can be better, that things can work better in your organization, that you can manage everything in your organization better and faster and, and with much more resilience than it is. But before we go into that, I want first to say what DevOps is not. Because uh, to me, this has always been the case that people consider DevOps having a DevOps team. DevOps is a culture. And if you have a DevOps team, that means you have an operations team with a fancy name. And that's why I believe it's wrong. I might be wrong, but yeah, you can prove me that that's not the case. Also, DevOps is not DevOps engineers. I hate that title. I hate when people are trying to put that as the person who is called a DevOps engineer is doing something very, uh, very strange, very different from all of the other people in the, in the team. Because I usually see DevOps people, like uh, operations people that have a tent to, the, to do development or developers who would like to also do some operation stuff. Because if you, if you, if you uh, take that title and put it to a single person, you're creating a silo in your team. The same, where, the same way you're creating silos with different operations teams and developers teams. And also, DevOps is not unicorns and rainbows that will fix all of your problems. 
you know. And DevOps is really something very, very simple. It's just operations and development together, right? It's, it's, it's just like that. It's not something that can uh, m magically you apply to your technical stuff. It's a way of, of, of people working together. So it's operations and development. Yeah, maybe security and maybe some other fists join here and there, de depending on your organization, but mostly that's the case. And, and this brings a lot of, yeah, a lot of work. Because in order to create that, in order to, to break those silos, you need to adjust a lot of things in your organization, technical things, organizational things. And yeah, that seems like a lot of work. Like you have to carry this load of, of splitting monoliths, of creating pipelines, of doing all of that. And, and that really uh, yeah, puts a pressure uh, on the organization. This is the thing that is really scaring people into doing it because when they face the amount of work that they have to do, like, okay, how, what do we have now? We have, in the past, we had organizations with monolith where we have development teams and QA teams and operations teams, and they all work in their little thing and they don't care about the others. So in order to break that, we know that we have to break a lot of walls that have been uh, uh, that have uh, reached to the sky through the years and yeah and that's that's pretty scary that that is preventing a lot of people from and in order to really uh, uh, visualize that in order to i to, to show you what my experience my experience showed is i have created this very scientific devops transformation chart for work to do. It's, yeah, copyright, everything, don't take photos, please, I will sue you. But this, this is how, in my eyes, work in your organization part of doing your DevOps transformation, when you start to break those walls. And, and as, you, as you start, there are different pinpoints on that graph which are uh, very interesting in terms, of, of, in terms of culture and how the people react to that. So if, if you start your DevOps on for, for a second, this is usually the place where the first DAO This is the place where work starts piling up. You have to do a lot of things which are not features, which are not yeah, things that the business wants. And most of the people like, hmm, that doesn't seem like I like, but yeah, okay. Let's see about it. Let's let's. They are still in the in the zone where they are beginning to get frightened, but not not much. Not that they want to stop. And then you reach the general concerns peak. So this is where people are like, okay, I don't think this is going to end. This is, this looks really scary now. I'm seeing more and more things coming up. I don't see anything resolving. And usually that's the case because in order to reap the fruits of, of DevOps transformation and of DevOps itself, you need to spend some time. You need to invest in that, in that cycle. But then it comes to the major crybaby peak. So this is the place where usually people start really nagging you on the head for doing DevOps transformation. They are like, why are we doing that? Do you see what is happening? I can't do my bugs. I can't do a feature. I have to work all the time. And you know that most of those things are not true because it's just a matter of prioritizing correctly and doing the correct things first. Yes, sometimes features have to go up front the DevOps transformation, but yeah, not many uh, not many organizations can afford to do a full feature freeze or something like that that can really enable them to quickly go through that graph. Otherwise, it, it feels more painful. And, and then as it goes on, you reach to when will we give up plateau? So this is the place where usually most of the developers come to you and say, okay, enough is enough. 
that's it. We are stopping now because it doesn't seem like we're going anywhere. But you have to be strong. You have to really resist that because you know that this other part will come. And you know that because I've told you, right? And, and then you reach the pe people trying to quit one. This is the most, let's say, scary for me because this is the place where people are, many of the people are fed up with what, what is happening. And those are the people, of course, who don't see the big picture. Those are the people who like what they're doing and they don't like to change. They want to skip into that direction. But again, afterwards, things began to go a little bit down because automation starts to do its job. Pipelines start to work. And the something fishy initial drop is like, hmm, there might be something to that. I can see it maybe but I'm still not convinced. This is what usually you get at that point. And then you get to the realization that automation might work, that it really works. Because DevOps is really pushing you to do, to automate, right? And the moment you reach a certain point of automation and tests, you begin to realize that it pays off. You begin to realize that this is something that can really push you further. And yeah, okay, it works, the second drop. So this is the place where people are now agreeing with you. This is the place where, yeah, I'm not sure that it will not fail in the future, but it seems to be working now. I like it, okay, let, let's go on, let's try it out. I'm not going to quit anymore. Maybe you raise my story a little bit, but yeah. And then you get really sweet part. Okay, let's go on. That's like that. I agree with you. I can see why you did this. I love you. Please, let's go. And I want to mention the this doesn't exist imaginary end. So you never get here. That doesn't exist. Sorry. Because of transformation never stops. It's the same as a product. You know that when you create a software product, it's never finished. It's never, okay, I've done all the features and all the bugs, I don't have to touch it anymore, that's it. Anybody know that ever happened anywhere? Besides that product, of course. And type of information is the same thing. Two things come, uh, you have to adapt, you have to evolve. And of course, it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't work the same way for everybody. And that's why you have to constantly change what you think about it and how you put it into practice in order to make, to make it succeed. And all of those different places on that graph are perceived differently by different people in your organization because people are different. People are very different. They, have, they perceive uh, yeah, ideas differently, they perceive results differently, they perceive work and free time differently, right? And that's why I think that you have to really uh, embrace that and use it. And I will talk about it a little bit more. But in order to prove that people are different, I would like to share a very personal story with you because you're my friends now, right? We're best friends. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I have three boys. I love them very much. That's the guys. And I want to share a story about my, the twins, the little ones that on the left side. So when they were little, they had started walking, which for boys is like six, seven years old, something like that. So they just started walking and they're playing in their room. And I'm doing something in the kitchen. I don't remember what. And my wife said, would you go and please check on the kids if they're okay, if they hadn't swallowed some toys or something like that. I said, sure, why not? And I go there and I enter the room and I see one of my boys trying to balance some bricks, some toy bricks. And yeah, he just learned to walk and it's very hard for him, but he's putting an effort. He's trying to do that. And Keep in mind, they are twins, so they should be very alike, right? So while, while one of them is doing that, sitting on the ground, 
I turn away and I see the other one licking the wall. I guess I know which one is going to college, right? But to prove my point, they are queens, but very different people. And yeah, of course, they are great and, and I love them very much and I am very proud of them. He's not in the wall anymore. But, but yeah, but they are so different in, in, in their way of thinking, in the, in, in the way of doing everything, right? And, and because of that, there are different personas that you will meet during your DevOps transformation. And I tried to identify a couple of those so that I can really uh, give you a little bit of, let's say, uh, a view into the future, what you're going to meet. Maybe I'm not almost sure that you can add them and you will very easily identify those in your organization. That's what I'm going to ask you now. While I'm going through those personas, try to map in your mind who I'm talking to you in your team. Who is that person that acts like this and does and thinks like this? And maybe, maybe I can help you work with that person better. So the first one is the old timer. So I'm sure you must have an old timer in your teams. You must have an old timer in your organization. Maybe you're the old timers. Usually old timers don't go to conferences, but let's say that yeah, you're a special kind of old timer. So old timers, how to identify them? They are usually very experienced professionals, either developers or operations people with more than 15 or 20 years of experience. They are usually, as I said, senior developers or team or tech leads. This is what they, they, they tend to be. Very skeptical about anything new, about DevOps, of course and operational work, DevOps, or developer work, if you're part of the operations organization. They are very uh, uh, strong believers in, in specialization. And uh, I really, uh, I'm always joking with them uh, that I'm, te I'm telling you, you know, specialization is for insects. Yeah. So they are very strong specialization believers that you have to be very, very good at development, if you try to do anything outside of that, that doesn't make sense for them, right? If they have to take care of things which are outside of the of writing code or outside of doing uh, operations work, they, they, it doesn't fit with them, it doesn't click with them. But they are perfectionists and they like to, to, to do things correctly into the details. So th that, way, that makes them very strong. So some catchphrases that you might hear those people say, this will never work. I don't care what it is, it will never work. I've tried that. Or I don't have time to do all of that. I need to code. I don't have time to do operations work. Somebody else has to do that. Another team has to do that. Or most of the developers have no clue what they do. Yeah, because I'm an old timer. I, I know what I did back in the day. I, used to program in assembler. I know how bits and pieces work. Yeah, can, can you do a bubble sort without an algorithm uh, library? No, you don't. It's up. Okay. This is usually what they, what they are. So, yeah, how do we engage with such people? How do we, how do we uh, make them help us? So, as, as I said, they are very valuable because usually they are very good professionals. They know how to write code, how to do operations, and they know the product that they're working on. They can be a pain very often through that process because it seems like they're trying to uh, sabotage. It seems like that they are not assi assisting you in any way. You can bounce ideas off of them. You can ask them and use them as a moral compass for some of the things you want to do in the organization. They are very quality oriented and this will help you keep the quality at a level because usually when you do such big things, you might face quality problems with your product at first before automation kicks in, right? And 
you have to constantly try to prove to them why DevOps works. That if you are able to win the win, because they will make things work for you. This brings me to the next persona that I managed to identify, which I like to call the full bananas. So the full bananas person is a DevOps alcoholic. They take everything to the extreme. They want to do everything by the book and how they envisioned it on conferences like that. They are very proactive and optimistic up to a point that yeah, they can be very annoying at some times. You, you found that in your organization, right? Because <laughs> I, I thought like, oh my God, yeah, that's Gary. We know him, yeah. He's such an annoying dude. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, to tell you a secret, I am a full bananas myself. I can be very annoying, and I've been told that, and I agree. But yeah, so usually they are your go-to person for DevOps advice on tooling. They usually understand and thrive doing both things, doing and operational stuff together. They are people-centric personas. They like to talk with people. They like to engage with them. They like to talk at conferences. And they are the complete opposite of the old timer. So they are like an antipode, if you will. So some catchphrases that I hear them say, that is not so hard, we, we, we can do that, all of that simultaneously, no problem, yeah. You can do features and bugs and infrastructure and testing, and please do it today. Come on, you have the time, why are you slacking off? Or they tell that the technical depth is a silent killer, which is true know that it is and finally they would say that yeah devops will set us free up to a uh, spiritual level if you will so what do you do with people like me of course you give them a lot of money and you love them unconditionally but beside of that they, you will put those people to lead your devops transformation because they will do it with a passion they will do it as if it's something that their life depends on and they, they will do everything in their power to do that and you should give those people freedom you should give you should empower those people and give them the possibility to influence decisions and to uh to uh, really drive and steer how things are being done but you need to monitor them yeah yeah, because they tend to spiral down the rabbit hole. And yeah, they can do some damaging stuff at some point if you don't do that. I, yeah, I've had my fair share, but yeah, I'm not willing to, yeah, explain that. All right, so the next one is the Young Hope. So the Young Hope are usually fresh young people with a desire to learn. Those are either your juniors or recently became seniors or even interns. Because I've seen that in many interns that I've worked with, the developer interns or operational interns. Because those are people either fresh out of university or, and they are very filled with positivity by reading blog posts, by watching conference talks and seeing that, okay, this is how it works. Yeah, we can put that into practice. I want to do this very poppy and fresh stuff. And usually researches are assigned to them. Like, uh, can you see if that pipeline would work in that way? Can you test it out? Do some little projects on the site? And legacy cost cares a hell out of them. Because, yeah, they usually don't have so much experience. So cat some catchphrases for those guys and girls. I can do that, I'll just Google it for a bit and yeah, sure it, it's that easy or Stack Overflow it or whatever or everything new and cutting edge is exciting stuff. So it has to be the latest version of that language, it has to be the latest version of that library, it has to be the latest whatever framework that emerged from the front end community in the past uh, half an hour, for example, yeah. And maybe this can be automated. 
because they don't like re doing repetitive stuff. This is what bores the hell out of them. So those are the people that really would want to do that extra step to, 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 to automate things. So what do you do with such people? Well, <clears throat> I, uh, this that I'm going to share now, it's not really something that I discovered myself. I kind of stole it from another person, from another conference, but I find it to work very well. And he said, uh, changing the mindset of a team that has been doing other way of work for a very long time at the same time is very hard, almost impossible. And most likely you will have old timers in that team which will prevent you from doing that. What you have to do is identify new hope in that team and work with them and make them your evangelist inside the team that can lead by example and turn the team from the inside out. You know, like a double agent kind of thing. That's what you need to do with those people. You need to push them give them guidance, and really ask them to colleagues and show how things can be done in a better way, in automate things, right? So uh, they, uh, you can get them hooked up first and almost in all cases it's already been done because as I said, they like new stuff and DevOps and SRE and all of those things are cutting edge. They are interesting. They want to do it. Right on. Let's jump on that train. And the, the last persona that I, I managed to identify throughout the years is the pragmatic. So, yeah, there's always a couple of those which are really, usually they are either managerial positions or, again, senior positions. And they are very skilled and they have very extensive experience they are kind of like the old timer, but not as narrow as the old timer. And they, they usually don't uh, think because they feel them like that. Usually they have opinions based with arguments and backed by arguments. And they will talk with you with arguments, which, is, which makes them a little bit annoying because you can't really uh, argue with them very much. And yeah, sometimes they just, yeah kill your buzz. So, uh, and they like to play it safe and risk as little as possible. They want to know that what you're trying to do will succeed at a very high rate. Some catchphrases for those are, yeah, we tried that already, it didn't work. Or experimenting is okay, gambling is not. And also, I prefer doing it slowly instead of failing quickly. So what, what does that mean for you in terms of, of DevOps transformation? Well, first of all, usually they play the voice of reason. And uh, the thing is, if you don't try to mitigate that, it can kill innovation. When you try to be pragmatic to a very large extent, you slow down and yeah, you can really kill the things that can, can, can drive you, can, that can innovate the, 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 your processes, your, your technical stuff, everything. Generally, people agree with them. So if you manage to win them over, others will listen to them. They are leaders by, yeah, by, as a persona. And uh, they can be a very strong ally, either uh, with uh, like the old timer or the full bananas. But if they don't support your DevOps transformation, if you don't manage to uh, persuade them, you will most likely have difficult time succeeding or even fail. So that's why I believe they are m m mostly the, maybe the most important persona that you need to win over, that you need to work with in order to, to succeed and to feel that. And yeah, being pragmatic to the extreme usually can make you make wrong decisions which are not future-proof. Because you try, to, you, you try to predict so far into the future 
that usually you are wrong. But again, I've identified those four now, but you know, there are many more. And I'm not saying that those are the most important ones. Those are the ones that I've managed to work with and I've managed to find out. And I think you will find them also. But yeah, so there are many, many others. And after all of this, you might be asking yourself, so, okay, what now? Why, why, why are we doing all of this? Why I'm saying that is that from my experience, usually not the technological obstacles are the thing that is preventing you from doing that and from achieving DevOps and from being more successful. It's always organizational, culture, mindset, people. These are the things that are really, really slowing you down. And I, I can easily back that with some data from some researches. I'm pretty sure that you've all heard about State of DevOps report that Google is publishing every year along with, with another company, Accelerate. So in that, in that report, every year they try to, I encourage you all to go and read it. It's not very long. It's like 40 pages, something like that. So in that report, they do a very extensive research. Many professionals and companies in, in the industry, big and small ones, on how they apply DevOps and how that works for them. And in that report, they have a very good quote that I want to so, sell. Culture is one of the top drivers of organizational and IT performance. Not technical problems, not changing the monolith or breaking it, not switching to Kubernetes or not. This organizational stuff. And again, another report that Google does, because you know, Google are very into that helps. I'm not sure if you heard about them, but uh, another report that they do is the so-called ROE of DevOps, not invest of DevOps transformation. Another very good white paper that they did. I also urge you to read it. So there's a very interesting example there, which I took out, that happened to AOL. I'm, heard, I'm sure you've heard of AOL. So Gene Kim, maybe you know, who knows who Jim Kim is? Okay, a couple of readers of the Phoenix project, okay. So he's a very, uh, very famous author for DevOps stuff. The DevOps handbook, the Phoenix project and the Unicorn project are books by Jim Kim. He's, you should, no, you must read all three of them. They are marvelous. So he was working back in 2008 in AOL and they had a very uh, a big problem that they had to update a Linux kernel from 2.4 to 2.6 in order to take advantage of multi-threading in, in their system. And it took months for that to happen. And you can imagine that in 2008, AOL was very siloed company with big, huge operations teams and huge development teams and so on and so forth. And they realized it was much more than a dev or ops problem. It was a business problem because it was hurting them on so many levels and they were losing money because of that. And what they did, they managed to improve that deployment time from six hours to 45 minutes by removing bottlenecks in the process. Not by finding some problem with the compatibility of the Linux kernel, not by uh, uh, having some new installations or uh, throwing more uh, compute power, they just, solved the process. They just solved the culture and the way things are done. And the conclusion of that white paper is that transformation pays off. The hopes that I've showed you, yeah, this is investment and it will pay off. And it, yeah, many people will be, well, yeah, it's hard to believe, right? Because yeah, all of those slopes make you uh, a, <laughs> a not so good believer in that in that theory. But this is why you would fail. Yoda said that. 
do can you say anything against Yoda? Come on. So if Yoda says that, it must be true. Like it's on the internet, right? And yeah, as I said, Jin, Jin Kim has those very good books. You must read them. They are DevOps novels. So generally, they are not technical books like a technical literature. They are novels, and they explain the process of a DevOps transformation in a fictitious company which is doing uh, uh, car parts called Parts Unlimited. And it's very interesting because they have the same approach by having identified different people and, and creating character, characters for them in that book. And he said in an interview, the moment I released that book, people started calling me and saying, you must be hidden somewhere in my organization because those people in that book are the people in my office. They think the same way, they do the same thing. And this makes you think that, yeah, there must be a pattern there. Yeah, people are different, but there are common grounds for many of them. Those books are very influenced by uh, The Goal, which is another very good book, which is done in the same manner, but for industrial uh, transformation back in the 80s or something like that. Also very good book, you should also read it. So yeah, and again, I cannot stress this enough. DevOps transformation is hard because the people are hard and people are there. And if you manage to work with them, if you manage to steer them, you will reap that, that, uh, that investment. You will have DevOps working for you. And with that, I want to thank you for being here. And I hope you liked it. You can find me on all of those places. I will be. I would love for you to hear your feedback, to tell me you know you're wrong. That's not how it works. Or DevOps sucks or whatever. I'm a product. I like discussing those things a lot. And thank you for being here.